ongoing relationship building with members of Congress. That's absolutely essential for us, that we're constantly at work on how we are building our relationship with members of Congress, are neutral to or supportive of the needs of low and middle income households. In addition to those criteria, we will consider whether and how to support any policy so as to not distract or confuse our volunteers or otherwise excessively divert our resources away from our core mission and policy goals. Note, we do not require that the policies have a high likelihood of passage. There sometimes we may support things just because it helps that member and helps our relationship, build our relationship with that member. It might not even be market-based or carbon pricing uh, or carbon pricing, or be mitigation focused. Now, just so you know, uh, in these efforts that have to do with the caucus, it probably will almost never be something that we'll reach out to you with. We'll be able to do this with the DC staff. The DC staff have proven to have quite a, a reach with their work in Congress, and so it, I, I think it will be rare that we'll be reaching out to you, but it is something that I want you to be aware is happening behind the scenes. Okay, I want to also just go over a little bit of how the organization is structured. So, you know, as I said, we get together twice a year and we basically try and reinvent the organization again. So we have different teams that work inside the organization. We have a management team that gets together and works on how we're managing everybody. The volunteer team, which you can see, by, has by far the most staff members assigned to it. We always understand that this is a volunteer organization and we only staff to the degree to which we can support volunteers. Uh, the communications team, and then other internal teams include administration, government affairs, fundraising, and strategy. And if you'll notice under strategy, nobody's listed there. Is that because this is a secret team? Yes. <laughs> this is our secret team. <laughs> For all those of you who it really annoys you when you don't know everything, sorry. <laughs> There's some people that I just like to be able to work with where I can talk to a small unit of people, talk about some of the things that we're working in, and get their feedback on it. Okay, as mentioned yesterday, we actually have two organizations. So one of the things that I'm working on all the time is two boards, two set of financial books, uh, two sets of bylaws. There's actually two organizations that we're running all the time. The Citizens Climate Education, which is where, you know, 80% of the income comes in because it's a 401c3, 501, whichever one. Yeah, 501c3, right? Okay. I'm pretty good at numbers, but not that good. Um, and then CCL, which is a, is a 501c4. Uh, and the boards of directors on um, Citizens Climate Education is Scott Lechman. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think most people in this organization are really interested in Marshall and what he started and kind of follow him and know that three years ago he had a pretty big health scare. And so he didn't think that he could be responsible being the chairman of the two boards, which he was, uh, given his health. And so um, he went out and looked for the person that he could most trust. And uh, Scott Leckman was someone that had been the chairman of the board for results, the organization that we modeled ourselves after very successfully, and has done really a really remarkable job. Marshall stayed on the board. Uh, Mark Tabard is on. Claudine Schneider is a former Republican member of Congress, so that adds something nice. Sandy Turner is a climate scientist, and Zena something or other. Um, <laughs> she uh, comes from Wall Street, and um, I think she'll be a source of some really good connections for, um, you know, fundraising is obviously always a big issue in a nonprofit. Then the uh, CCL board, uh, Ross Astori is the chairman. He's a law professor. He's been published in the area of the border adjustment. Uh, boy, you know, he's one of the, he runs our boot camp every year. Um, probably knows as much about policy as the rest of us combined. Uh, Marshall's on that board, George Hetzel, and then Jerry Hinkle and Mary Selkirk, who we introduced um, yesterday. So then regarding CCL and CCE, CCL is really the identity we have to the world, what most people recognize us as, but it's where the not most the income comes in because people don't get a write-off. I mean, we were really stunned last year when we said we wanted to add staff to the DC office and would people be willing to contribute so that we could bring people on and that we blew through that uh, last year's uh, budget for CCL was uh, a little over four hundred thousand dollars and because all the people in March who jumped in we raised over seven hundred thousand um, we will be doing a small fundraiser for CCL again this year because we have um, 
I'll send out pictures in the newsletters what the office space looks like. We need a little more space. <laughs> We've got everybody on top of each other and actually know where, if an NGO comes in, where, where we can meet. CCE is where the majority of our staff work goes through. It's the majority of our funding. It's where Andy won $2 million grants last year and then where we exceeded the fundraising goal from, um, you know, we had the $600,000 match, we raised over 800. That's where the majority of the income comes through. Again, it's, it's two separate organizations, two separate boards, uh, and they have to be kept distinct. Um, you know, technically, under IRS guidelines, about 15% of a 501c3's budget could be used for lobbying, but we take the most conservative stance we can, and anything that would be identified as lobbying, we run it through the C4. Because we think at some point, you know, as things move along, there are certain interests that would not like us to succeed, so we take the most extreme case of uh, where we would spend money on what we call, quote, lobbying, okay? All right, so let me ask, um, uh, Mary and Tony to join me, and are we going to use the chairs over there, Stuart? Yeah. Okay, and you want to introduce this, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, can you move the chairs forward to about here? Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, if you could share this. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> All right, so this is... Uh, but what we're going to be going into now is a question and answer with the CCL board. So whatever questions you have to ask. Um, but we're going to do this in a couple different ways. So first off, there's microphones up here so you can stand up and come up and, and ask a question. But we're also going to be taking questions uh, by text and online that you can just submit because we want to be able to hear from everybody and maybe you have a question you're like, I want to ask this question, but I, I don't want to be the one asking the question right there. So you can submit it online and I'll be mo watching those and I'll be asking the board uh, on them. So I'll be able to collect them. So if you wish to participate and want to submit a question that I'll be sorting through and asking the board, follow these instructions. You can, with a smartphone, go to that URL or you can just text CCL NorCal, the phrase CCL NorCal, that word, to that phone number, and uh, you'll be able to submit questions by text. All right, if you're going to ask a question at the microphones, we ask that you ask one one-part question with no follow-up questions <laughs> so that we can get to as many people as possible because we really want to be able to address as much as possible here. All right? Sound good? Any comments? Yes, I do want to point out that neither Tony nor I are on the board, but we'll be happy to answer questions okay. also. <laughs> How would you... Okay. <laughs> The people present, you can ask questions there. <laughs> if you wish to direct them to a particular person, just um, include that in your question. All right, thank you. Could you begin? Sure. Uh, good morning, uh, Robert Mullen, Silicon Valley North chapter. Um, I was wondering, uh, am I close enough? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if you can tell us what each chapter can do to raise money for whatever expenses they have. You know, this is for CCE overall, but um, what are some of the ways that chapters have told you or that you know yourself are good ways to raise money locally for local expenses? Thanks. Sure, I, I can answer that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so local chapters can raise money. They, they can't do it as a tax deductible donation unless they were to set up their own 501c3. We don't have the resources to run those all through our central uh, nonprofit system. So uh, I think local chapters can do a lot of things. Some pass the hat at meetings, some do, uh, I mean, you could do a benefit concert, you could, uh, you know, have a raffle or an auction or, you know, any number of different things. Um, you know, people have done fundraisers for scholarships to get people to D.C. Specifically, there's online systems like GoFundMe or Indiegogo or something like that that you can use. And a lot of chapters have had success with that, especially when it's for a specific targeted, you know, we want to get these people to D.C. or we want to buy this new thing, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I don't know if... Yeah. Great. Question from online. What ways can we get involved with CCL in a career manner, even in a smaller capacity? I can say something about that. You mean career like working here? I, I, I presume so. Okay. Well, there's been a pretty clear path to um, people working here that's been the case in almost every single person that's been hired. 
And that is, in most of the cases, somebody did something so extraordinary that we just had to hire them. So for instance, you know there's something called CCL University and CCL Community, right? Those were both built by Ricky Bradley when he was a volunteer. So what he did is he said, wow, look at this. Uh, this is something that would really help the organization. And so basically, his husband worked full time so that Ricky could full time build that. Uh, it took him a long period of time, but it was just obvious we need to add someone who's bringing that kind of benefit to the organization. Same thing with Madeline Para. We start doing the conferences early on, and there's this just truckload of people that come from Wisconsin every time. Wisconsin has eight congressional districts and 18 groups. So, you know, yesterday I talked about adding Leslie Beatty, and I think if you, the impact that looking at the value statement had on you, had on me, then, um, you know, it's just, okay, this is, a, this is a need we now have that we never had before. The other avenue has been, um, we have a lot of run interns that come through the office. And sometimes they just stand out so distinctly from other interns in terms of their ability to do research, initiative, um, you know, get things done. And, and again, it's because you've had a chance to work around someone for six months or a year. So one of the really nice things is until last year, we'd never looked at a resume. We just, people had performed and it was kind of like, okay, we can't go on without this person. So it's, it, it's been like that so far. I hope it continues like that. Two examples of subverting democratic process might be corporations using money to uh, affect uh, elections and also lobbyists doing an end run around big pharma, et cetera, end run around the people in order to get congressmen and senators to vote a certain way. I love C CCL, and yet we're lobbyists. <laughs> so we're not, we're doing an end run around the people by trying to get CFD passed. Any comments? Okay. Sure, Th thanks for that. It's a really interesting perspective. Um, I think that you, we use the word lobby for a very explicit reason to um, really identify that what we're trying to do is to train ourselves as regular people to do what all the other lobbyists in Washington do, except we don't get paid. And we build our capacity and we build our message based on how many people we can uh, reach out to in our respective districts so that we know with great confidence that when we go talk to our member of Congress and we have 50 endorsement letters and we have you know, 12 letters to the editor in the previous month and an op-ed piece, that we feel like we do have the, we're speaking the voice of the people in our district. So I think that's a big difference, so. Question from online. How do the midterm elections affect our short-term strategy? He's the strategy yeah, guy. Yeah, I'm the strategy guy. Um, so we actually, uh, on, our, on our strategy team, uh, we, it's on our agenda to talk about like what are scenario plannings. Like there's very various possibilities of what could happen in the midterms um, and we need to be prepared for all those possible outcomes because you know we won't know until November. Um, in the short term, in terms of what's gonna happen during the election process, uh, we find that during election years, a lot of activists and advocates are are focused on those elections and so are less able to focus on some of the other work that, that we're doing in CCL. So that's a factor that how the midterms affect us. Also, um, I mean, it has an effect on Congress. So um, I'm hopeful that, um, I mean, right now in the media, people are talking about that there's a, you know, a strong potential that Democrats could um, have a, a wave election, could take, take a lot of seats in the House, it might flip control, that even the Senate might flip control. That puts pressure on Republicans to uh, engage this year while they have control of those uh, offices. And so we're hopeful that that will motivate them to uh, you know, put their mark on climate and carbon pricing now while they have that uh, control of those, of, those, um, of those bodies. So it could be to our favor to, to see that right now. Also, we'll see a lot of Republicans in swing districts who are needing to uh, campaign on things towards the center to, to attract votes, and you can call that greenwashing or not, but they're basically trying to appeal to the constituents in their district, and we can see how that will, could potentially bring them around to really voicing 
uh, pro-climate messages and maybe even taking on some of our, some of our, some of our agenda. So those are just some, some of the things. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, Tony and I are in the same chapter. We're in, we're in the Alameda chapter. And we actually, um, uh, Tony, I think, made up a, uh, a, a, not a laser talk, but a set of talking points to inspire our chapter last week to talk about this very issue in terms of our own respective bandwidths for this coming year. Like, you know, do we really want to focus on unseating certain Republicans or Democrats or whatever, you know, candidates that we think are not really optimally carrying our message, or do we really stick with our fundamental belief in bipartisanship? So it really yielded a pretty interesting conversation, I think, among the 40 people that were at our meeting. And I imagine every single person in this room is really pondering that, you know, because we all have only so much energy, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to add one thing. You know, we've always stayed out of elections uh, because, you know, there's nothing that can create bad will with someone like campaigning against them. So that's as a CCL position. I certainly hope as an individual you're going to be out there working for people. I will be. So I'll be, I'll be walking precincts. I'll be making phone calls for people I support. I'm, I'm hoping you will as an individual, but I'm going to be doing that as Mark Reynolds, not as part of Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm really well, in, oh, just in a re response to who said, well, what do we conclude? We didn't conclude anything. We really, it was a, it was, you know, here's the diversity of views in the room. I'm really interested in this scholarship fund that you mentioned. Is there a way to donate directly to it and or to earmark donations for it? We're not, um, we're not big enough yet to be able to handle a lot of things like that administratively that we'd like to. So, you know, we would like at some point to be able to take donations and give them back to chapters. We'd like to be able to earmark things like that. It's, for us right now, it's complicated enough just managing um, the foundation grants that go to certain areas. So I would love to say yes, and I would anticipate in the future we would be able to do that. Um, obviously, a lot of chapters have done that for their own chapter. Um, but I, I would hope that it's something we could do more in the future, too. Uh, I have a couple things to say about that. As you know, last year we did an informal travel ship uh, solicitation to send a couple of college students from the Central Valley to Washington. And Jennifer Wood, I don't know if she's here, but she's um, our Heartland Regional Coordinator and has been taking up the gauntlet on trying to um, basically formalize that didn't, you know, we didn't manage to pull it together by the conference. Um, but that's really focusing on each enabling and providing some kind of way for every individual chapter to consider how they um, in themselves could raise money for um, a candidate in their own chapter that they'd like to send. So it's both identifying possible candidates, young people, um, people with limited means that would be good candidates. So that's one thing. And then I think nationally, <coughs> I haven't said this to Mark, but I think as we do outreach to different communities that we have not reached out to uh, very well yet, and we want to encourage a way for everyone in CCO, all volunteers, to be able to come to Washington, I think that's going to raise the issue of how do we um, create some path for uh, people with less resources to be able to go to DC as, and participate in the conference. So. Question, uh, how active are the boards? How often do they meet? Are the members of the boards analogous to shareholders with a voice in the governance? What a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I said yesterday, so the boards meet um, in person twice a year. Um, and that's evolved, actually. I think that's um, because now we have a second lobby day in November, where this year we had as many people in November as we'd had in Washington a couple years ago. So uh, try to calendar in-person board meetings and they tend to be joint meetings for both boards. Um, in between there are teleconferences periodically throughout the year. Um, I think the, in terms of the level of activity of different board members, it varies a lot. What I really observe about this, both of these boards, they're still in the early stages of development and getting our chops together to be 
really the kind of board that this organization um, deserves. And so we're in the middle of that right now, including expanding the, the, um, the diversity, particularly the CCE board. So was there something else about governance? Yeah, well, do they have any role in governance like shareholders? Mark and I do argue for about that. Company. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, typically the role of a board is to be um, a, a, a strategic um, partner for the staff. And that means we get to think about big stuff because, um, you know, we're not in the day to day grind, so to speak. So that's how I think of it in part. Okay. Um, so shareholders, maybe, uh, that's a good way to think about it. Thank you. Thank you. The House Caucus doesn't have a lot of visibility in the national media. Why not create a Senate Caucus and or a talking head on cable TV? Um, so we, we've certainly interested in the Senate having a similar uh, arena where there can be bipartisan discussions on climate change. In the Senate, in general, they don't do caucuses. They're a smaller body, so um, there's less impetus to do that. They get to meet with each other more often. You know, you often will see the gang of four and the gang of six, and you know, people will get together in more informal uh, groups, or they'll be called things working groups. So we have put, you know, we've asked senators, you know, can, can we start some similar thing? Can we have a Republican climate resolution? Can we have a caucus equivalent? Um, and we haven't been able to manifest that yet, but we'd love to see it. Um, so as far as getting a talking head on, in the media, I mean, you know, we don't control the caucus, we also don't control the media, but um, we'd love to see someone who could be a real spokesperson for bipartisan uh, climate action. And I think right now, Curbelo is, is being the most outspoken from that side of the aisle on that, on that topic. And, and it gets some coverage, but not as much as we'd like. It's still up to us to uh, amplify that and make sure that it is getting out to as many people as possible, because it, it's not the narrative that people expect and it's not, it's still the case, I feel like there's so many people I talk to and they're shocked when I tell them that the Climate Solutions Caucus exists and I just wish more people knew of its existence and that it, the indication of how different that is than what they expect about the partisan uh, politics in Washington right now. Thank you. All right, question from here. What happens when a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus retires or loses their seat? Uh, Said another way, what is the impact of losing Republicans from the Climate Solution Caucus? What should CCL constituents in their district do to prepare for that? Uh, what you should prepare for is that um, there's a very good chance that we could lose somewhere between two thirds and three fourths of the Republicans in the midterm election. So uh, if you just look at their districts. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody take Peter Joseph out and talk to him. <laughs> um, so we, we, should, we should be ready for that and know that we might be in a whole new rebuilding effort at the beginning, at the, at the end of this year. So, I mean, you know, political winds shift quickly, but that wouldn't surprise me entirely. I mean, I, I'm as much of a political junkie as probably everybody else here, and I read what a lot of people write, and I look at those people's districts, and there's a good chance we lose a lot of the Climate Solutions Caucus. So, uh, you know, we've found that our ability to grow that, the rate at which it accelerates now, um, is really significant. So I'm not, I'm not that worried about it, but as a political reality, we should be ready for it. And I'll just add that in the last election, uh, we ended up with more Democrats than Republicans on the caucus. And within, before they were even sworn in, we were able to bring that back up to parity and then add them two by two again. So I imagine we might do something uh, similar, although it'll be a bigger lift after, uh, it could be potentially a bigger lift after the next election. And we're also working, uh, encouraging the caucus to develop other leadership besides Curbelo because he is in a vul vulnerable district. And so to make sure that uh, whoever is left on, uh, in the, on the caucus is there already taking a leadership role. I just wanted to point out that since the last election, the size of the caucus has almost quadrupled, and that all happened pretty much post, uh, post election, after the election, when there were, I think, three Republicans who were defe or defeated or retired or whatever. So I think we have to appreciate that there's some momentum going on that we maybe don't quite understand. But, you know, in spite of all the utter chaos of this year, there's been this exponential growth of, of the caucus. 
Steve Levin. <clears throat> First, thanks for your leadership. Um, it's wonderful that we've attracted so many volunteers and substantial funding from foundations and from the match, fantastic. Now at some point, a donor is gonna say, I have a limited pot to give to environmental causes, and I've given to CCL, but when is enough enough for them? I mean, why would I give another dollar to CCL and, uh, instead of another worthy environmental initiative? And particularly, I want to hear the case of how more dollars will lead to a larger marginal impact, not a slightly diminished marginal impact. Like, what do you do with even more money and what's the case for making CCL the priority, actually even more so in the future than in the past? So um, I think it's good to kind of co contrast us with other environmental groups that you might give money to. So I think EDF brings in about $300 million a year. Um, Sierra Club about the same. Uh, NRDC, uh, so they, they bring in hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, if you give them $1,000, it's like clipping a little piece of your finger off, I mean the fingernail off. If you give us $1,000, it means a whole bunch more citizens got to DC that otherwise didn't get there. So, you know, um, in terms of uh, will there be a point where um, people will say, I don't know how much appetite I have to give, I think that's going to depend on the results we produce. And I, and I, you know, I think we have an obligation to deliver the goods. Uh, and that we don't get a unlimited amount of time to make the case that we have the best solution. You can't just have the best solution, you also have to prove that you can create the political dynamic in which that solution is implemented. And I don't believe you get an unlimited amount of time to make that case. And, and I'll just say that, you know, in the ecosystem of working on climate, you know, there, we need to be, we need people working on all channels. Um, and so it is important that we're supporting a lot of different efforts, a lot of different organizations, state level, local level, national level. I think we're one of the only organizations working on the channel that we're working on. We're doing something special. There is no one else working at the federal level, bipartisan, working on carbon pricing. Like, we are the organization doing that. And if you believe that that is one of the ways that we're going to solve climate change, then citizens' climate lobby is the way to go. And so that's what I would say to any, any donor who's questioning. And like, are there other channels that are worthy of giving? Definitely. Um, but you know, do you get a lot of bang for your buck in doing this? Yes, because if, you, if we're not doing this, no one else is doing this. <laughs> Is there, any, is there any serious discussion of using a PAC, that's a political action committee, that supports CCL objectives? No. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, another quick question. Where can we get some CCL merch? <laughs> yeah, the CCL Zazzle. swag. Where can we get that? Zazzle.com? I don't know. You go to our website. I think there's a place you can order it. I don't know. <laughs> So Tasha has a, an especially fetching t-shirt that she's wearing today that she designed on Zazzle. So there you go. And at, at some point, we will bring back the original retro CCL hat, which nobody makes look better than Peter Joseph, that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, one of your primary focuses, foci, is uh, grass tops, endorse, more endorsements. I've heard it said that just getting local businesses in our, in our district, which where we have supportive members of Congress, is like a waste of time. We should be focusing on the big people. I want to know about that. Okay, so 2009 was the last time we got close to passing something, right? The House passes 1,400 page complicated Waxman market, but nevertheless it passes something go over to the Senate, try and put different things together, none of them come along. There's a political scientist at Harvard named Theda Scotchpole. She writes over a 100-page criticism of why we failed, and at the heart of her criticism were two issues. One was all the support for legislation was inside the Beltway and it needed to be back home in the district. So the, the endorsements in the districts are absolutely essential to our, her, our success. The second piece that was really interesting is she said that Anything you do to mitigate global warming is going to increase people's costs, so if the revenue 
from whatever kind of bill doesn't go back to households, people won't support it. So that's secondary to your question, but the first part is one of the best political scientists in our country says we don't succeed without that. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, uh, why such a low price for CO2, $15 a ton? Uh, Nicholas Stern recommended $35 a ton in 2007. Stanford researcher said it would need to be greater than or equal to $200 a ton in t back in 2015. So why such a low price for carbon dioxide, $15 a ton? Me, Stuart, just a quick question. Is Dave Klein or Chris Moylan in the audience? <laughs> Part of our next panel. There we go. Thank you. Um, Dave, you mentioned that you don't have a lot of so the $15 is just the starting price, and we believe it's important to start low and ramp up steadily and, and aggressively uh, because we want uh, the economy, households, businesses, investors to, to both start slowly so that there's time for the transition, but also see the trajectory and know that, uh, you know, in our policy, in 20 years, the price is $215. And so that is the kind of price level that you need to incentivize the shifts that we, that we need to see. Uh, but you can't start there. And so when we see policies suggested where you start at $40 a ton, which you know people pull out because it's uh, related to the social cost of carbon, uh, that will have a certain impact, but it's almost too big of a shock to the system in year one. We prefer a, a smaller thing, but we want to be at $40 really soon. And yet, if it starts at 40 and only goes up at 3% a year, it's never going to get to that $200 that we think is needed to really uh, you know, create the dramatic shift that's needed over that 20 years to reduce emissions. Thank, Linda Moran, thank you so much for having this panel. The questions are great and the answers are great. Um, I am still trying to get clear about the relationship between the, our nonprofit status and the, how that uh, uh, relates to chapters. So for instance, we're trying to rent the Veterans Hall in Santa Cruz to do a, a showing of Tidewater and the Burden. And one of the things that that venue requires is that we show our, quote, non-profit um, status and also that we can get insurance. Um, so what do we do? You know, who, who are we in with regard to that? Yeah, so um, Olivia Malonis um, manages all that in our office. Uh, actually, the, you know, Getting liability insurance is insane for an organization like this. And we do have to get insurance for every single one of those events. So if you contact me or Olivia, we'll get you the insurance information. We'll get you all the stuff that you need. We, there are hundreds of those events that happen every year. We're very used to, to helping you through that process. Uh, and it's something that we do need to be provided as an organization. We do provide it. Um, and so we're happy to, to give you whatever you need, and I'm sure that we have what you need to, to make that uh, place comfortable. Thank you. Yeah. What is the sense of the CCL national staff about Republicans on the caucus using the caucus for greenwashing? Or, put it another way, will they vote for a price on carbon, whatever form it takes? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to say about the caucus. I mean, one, you can say, like, maybe it is greenwashing, and isn't that freaking awesome that Republicans think it's a good idea to, wa to, to proclaim their support for climate change. This is progress. They didn't want to do that five years ago. Now they do. They think that's what their constituents want. They're responding to their constituents, and they're you know, trying to you know, give them what they want. They want, them, they want their representative to be pro-climate. <clears throat> Now the concern is that will they come through with their votes when the, when the time comes? Will they put their money where their mouth is? And um, you know, it's not a test. Uh, the caucus, is, there's no test for carbon pricing support or something like that. We, you know, the bar is, are you willing to engage on the conversation about climate solutions? So uh, I have no doubt that some of the Republican members and some, maybe even some of the Democratic members on the caucus, they might vote, vote no for a policy that we introduce because they're all politicians. They have a lot of different pressures. There's a lot of different things in there. Do I think the majority of them are interested in, in solutions that meet their values that they think will address the problem? Then yes, I do think that there's, you know, we're, we're excited for them to be uh, introduce that legislation, to sponsor that legislation, to vote for that legislation, uh, but that doesn't mean that all of them will do so. But we still think that it furthers our efforts. The more Republicans, the more members there are on the caucus, uh, changes the narrative, 
breaks down the partisan divide on, on climate and moves us towards our goal even if they're not gonna vote for our policy later. We still think it, it's supportive of our, it moves us down the road. Thank you. <clears throat> Jennifer Wood, Sacramento chapter. So in Sacramento, we run up against a lot of policy people who are looking at the Remy report, actually, and, uh, and we've gotten some criticism that it's outdated and some of the assumptions, you know, need to be looked at, and I'm wondering if there's any thought of doing either updated Remy or some other economic modeling or studying about it. Yeah, so we've, um, we, what we want to do is make sure we have a diversity of studies. So we've engaged another organization that um, is going to do a, a preliminary Remy overview. Um, I give Danny $150,000, I don't give it to him, you do, for studies every year. And uh, that preliminary study will cost $90,000. Um, we hope that the information is compelling enough to do what we really want, which is to do an expanded study, which will also go on a state-by-state -state basis. That study is about $300,000. But we think if the $90,000 study is compelling enough, then Andy can go to foundations and say, look at what this information gives us. Uh, you know, we'd like another half a million dollars to, to do additional work like this. So yes, we are working on that. We want to have a diversity of studies. Uh, even though the Treasury Department study pretty much backed up the things that are in Remy. But, you know, you know how economists are, right? No matter how somebody else does it, you know, they're, they've always got their own modeling that they think is the way it should be done. So, yes, we will be doing more studies. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I, I do want to let you guys know that on uh, Community, there's a place to get merch through signs.com. <laughs> and it's expanded and really nice, so. Nice. On the CCL community, and you don't have to log in, I don't think. I think you can just find the place to go to signs.com. Mm -hmm. I think it's under resources. And under resources, there's like a signs and, and other printable materials. Great. Okay, so um, what needs to happen before carbon fee and dividend legislation will be introduced? And I'm interpreting this as a, based on another question too, like what would need to happen procedurally in, the, in Congress? before carbon fee and dividend legislation will be introduced? What groundwork would need to be, be done as well? Right. So uh, this is, this is uh, Danny Richter, our legislative uh, vice president or whatever he is. Uh, so he, he, he's, he's put together the list of like, here's all the steps that it takes. You know, this is like schoolhouse rock, like, but like 401 instead of 101. It's the, you know, so a bill has to be sent to legislative council to review the text so that it's written in like official uh, legalese, you know, to, to be a bill. It's got to get um, introduced by in, in either the House or the Senate. It, go, it often needs to then get scored by the Congressional Budget Office or the, what's the other one called? The, J, yeah, the JCT, yeah, yeah, yeah. the JCT. Mm -hmm. Anyone know what that means? Joint Committee on Taxation, <laughs> Committee on taxation. great. <laughs> um, and so, you know, those are, those are some of the like procedural steps for what it takes for, for a piece of text to become a bill and actually be introduced into Congress. Uh, politically, what needs to happen from our point of view, I mean, we could have introduced a bill years ago if we were willing to have uh, it introduced by Democrats, but we really want this to be a bipartisan bill. So we feel like we, that, that there, it's unlikely that one Republican is gonna uh, take that step on their own, so we've been trying to get you know, five to 10 Republicans to be willing to sign onto that bill from the start, and that's, um, that's really the heavy lift. I mean, the, the procedural part of getting it through, through legislative council is, and, the, and the reviews, those are relatively easy, but uh, making sure that, there's the, that there are members of Congress who feel that they have the support and are ready to take that step, that's, that's what we're working on right now, and that's what you're working on. And um, we feel optimistic on that, but, it's, uh, but that's, that's what we're waiting for right now, is for those brave representatives to take that step and introduce that legislation. Great, thank you. This is the last question, so come on up. Hi, I'm Whitney in San Francisco. There's a lot of talk this year about a carbon tax being included in some form of tax reform. Do you envision a carbon fee uh, being included in any other major issue legislation in the future, or are you hoping that it's a standalone package? I don't know okay. about Okay, um, some people have talked about it being part of an infrastructure um, package to pay for infrastructure. Um, I, I don't think that's a good case scenario for us. 
Um, we've always wanted this to be standalone, and um, you know, Peter will tell you in his meetings with Secretary Schultz that Secretary Schultz would say tax reform needs to be done, but something this complicated, something this big, needs to be distinct. It needs to be simple. Um, so we're hoping that it's standalone, and it's something we would argue adamantly for of it being standalone if it got proposed inside of something else. Frankly, I was really it was a huge sense of relief to me when it did not get thrown into the tax overhaul proposal. Because I don't think if it's obvious to households that their, actual, their costs are being mitigated, it's not going to last. And the same thing Tony was talking about of a bill being introduced by Republicans, unless it's bipartisan, it's not going to last. So A, it's got to be obvious to households, and it's got to be standalone, I believe, to do that. And B, it needs to be bipartisan, and that's why the caucus is so important. And I'll right. just quickly add that now that t tax cuts on, uh, for corporations, you know, how they've already gotten that, that's one less thing that people will be pushing for with the carbon tax. So we're more likely to see it uh, written as a dividend rather than as a tax shift to corporations. So silver lining. All right. Let's thank our panel. Thank you.